Hi everyone and welcome back to Thursdev. My name is Luke and this week we're continuing into the fourth and final part of our business model segment where I'd like to wind down our talk about monetization by talking about the practice of game monetization on the whole, what it ultimately exists to accomplish and why we as game developers keep working on refining the model. We spent three episodes at this point going over the what of game monetization, as well as to a certain extent the who, when, and where, but today I wanted to focus a little bit on the why. It's very likely that you're already well aware that games are a for-profit business, so I won't just leave it there. I'd like to talk a little bit today about what profits look like in games now, and what these business models do for games and the game industry. In every example of game monetization, there are two major intertwined goals that need to be fulfilled in order for a game to be considered a success. It needs to be self-sustaining, which is to say that it needs at least to break even on its development cost, and it needs to deliver a product to as many consumers as possible in as easy a manner as is possible. These two factors have been the driving force between basically every single innovation in game monetization to date. In a nutshell, to make a business out of game development, a game needs to make money, or at least not to lose money. This I believe is pretty easy to understand, if not palatable perhaps for some. I spent a solid 14 minutes explaining the concept of the man month in an earlier Thursday video, but as a brief recap, there are far more things that go into the cost of game development than you might expect. Salaries, equipment, rental of office space, software rentals, platform and engine licensing fees, and once a game is nearing completion, PR costs. When a game is released, the distributor also takes a sizable cut of the gross earnings of the game, as well as a publisher if you have one, and that's not including ESRB, Cero or Peggy rating evaluation fees, printing fees, manufacturing fees, logistics fees, and the retailer's cut in the case that you're distributing a physical packaged product. For a development studio working with a publisher, even when revenue share isn't a given, the studio can end up making as little as 15 to 20% of the net profit on a physical packaged game. That can be a very small amount if the product is among the large percentage of games that don't break 100,000 copies sold. And games often don't sell that many copies. According to Steam Spy, of the almost 3,000 games released on Steam in 2015, including free-to-play games, 45 games broke 1 million and 451 broke 100,000 copies. In 2014, of 1,785 games, 60 broke a million owners and 463 broke 100,000. And despite games becoming more expensive to make as the bar for quality continues to rise, prices are actually going down. With a saturated market and a lot of cheap options available, only the really big names can afford to charge what they've always charged for their games, and the rest of us have to innovate. Why is that, you might be wondering? One word. Devaluation. The average game consumer is now willing to spend much, much less on a game than they were prior to the internet age. The greatest weight in the shift, in my mind, lies on Rovio. Really, as it was thanks to Rovio's massive undercut of other premium games on the App Store at the time of the release of Angry Birds, creating a race to the bottom as more players flocked to the cheaper but comparable quality apps. A large segment of the game's consumer base saw a 99 cent game that was ridiculously popular in Angry Birds and were no longer willing to pay the $5 that other games were charging on the App Store. This had a ripple effect into the rest of the game space, and as digital distribution thrived and it became significantly easier for independent developers to get their games into the hands of consumers, a similar price war was waged and the consumer won at about $15 for a non-AAA premium game. So when you consider that the average game retails for about $15 now, and frequently those numbers are going to be skewed by sales figures, bundles, and midlife discounts, even selling 100,000 copies of a premium game after the average 30% cut for the distributor, that's just over a million dollars to cover all of our development costs if we aren't going through a publisher. Harkening back to our Man Month video, we'll use our hypothetical 10-man dev studio's $60,000 a month development overhead, giving us 17 and a half months worth of development funds before spending any money on those external costs. And games can take a long time to make, a year or more isn't unrealistic, and that's the best case scenario. Why am I throwing these numbers at you? It's to drive home a point. Development is expensive, especially for high quality games and return is quite small these days. 
These numbers will vary, no two studios are the same, but at the end of the day, unless you're a hobbyist and not attempting to make a career out of it, or you're just filthy rich and have money to throw down a hole for a passion project, the game you release has to make some kind of a profit. And that's where secondary monetization like DLC and microtransactions start to really make sense. Well, it's prohibitively expensive to create a sequel to an existing game, and creating a sequel without vast improvements and innovations on the previous iteration are generally frowned upon, expansions and other DLC are much easier to create, and now, after many years, significantly more accepted by the gaming public. The groundwork for a game exists, and the additional content can be layered on top of it without the worry of having to change too much. You can also create small storylines within an existing game, add weapons, equipment, areas to explore, and those take up significantly less time and team resources. While a game might take a year or more to build, a piece of downloadable content for that game could take as little time as a month by only half of your team, give or take a week or so for QA. Release that for $5, and even if only 10% of the user base download the content pack, it's still $35,000 profit after the licensor's cut for, say, $15,000 worth of work. The return on DLC is potentially much higher than that of the base product. Does this lead to some DLC being created from content cut from a game that wouldn't have been 10 years ago? It's entirely possible, I can't speak to the motivations of every developer out there, but it's just as likely that the content of your DLC pack would have ended up scrapped and on the cutting room floor altogether if it wasn't for something that the company could capitalize on. Let's look at the freemium model though. These are full games that are given to the player free of charge for all intents and purposes, basing their revenue model around the option to either grind sometimes, or to spend money to buy time or items to reduce play friction. The free to play model, despite being demonstrably profitable for many, is also risky. I've worked on games that did well with microtransactions, and I've also been close to the development of a game that was what is colloquially known as a bottomless money pit, which is to say money keeps getting thrown in, but it never fills and it never comes back. When a developer releases a free to play game to the market, the assumption is that there are going to be some people who enjoy the game enough and are interested enough in overcoming the game's imposed friction to monetize. I haven't done nearly enough research into the psychology of monetization to state whether these players are begrudgingly monetizing, happily supporting their favorite games, or just plain ambivalent about the whole process of monetization, but regardless, on average, 1 in 50 players will, at some point, spend anywhere between a dollar or two to a few hundred dollars on a game. It averages out to roughly $20 to $25 per paying user, ultimately. This means that the developer is incentivized not only to get their game out to as many players as humanly possible to maximize the size of that 2% or less through things like social media integration, friend invite incentives, and social gameplay features like forming player groups in-game, but also to make their monetization as attractive and frictionless a process as possible, and to create the greatest value for the monetized player to get them to feel like it's worthwhile to monetize again. This is what spurred the creation of the now industry standard premium currency. As a brief overview, a premium currency is one that exists in the game, but is bought with real money and works as a surrogate for real money. Generally speaking, a small amount of this premium currency is also given to the player to test out in whatever way they see fit, to get used to it, and to understand its worth. By allowing the player to understand the worth of a premium currency, they're more likely to consider it an option for monetization if and when they run out. The premium currency becomes the basis for essentially every other transaction within the game. All timer skips, additional gacha, premium character skins, whatever, they're all managed through the payments within the game using this premium currency. It's extremely clean and it comes with a few benefits. There's only one thing for the players to really buy. The player doesn't have to search around through a number of DLC packages to find what it is that they want. They buy the currency and then the currency is used within the rest of the game. It's also versatile. Premium currency can really be applied to any number of possible objects within a game. It's easy to apply a cost in premium currency to things that you couldn't traditionally offer through an individual purchase, including things of very small value. 
Generally speaking, most platforms shy away from any DLC purchase that isn't roughly in one US dollar increments. This means that the developer is generally speaking shoehorned into overcharging, sometimes grossly, for something extremely small that the player may want to purchase. This gives the developer the freedom to subdivide the value of a single purchase, and gives the player the freedom to choose where that subdivision goes. And it's extremely convenient, as typically its use will be designed right into the game it's integrated in. It is to the traditional content purchase model what the debit card has become to the retail landscape. And that's the goal of business models like these. To make it as seamless a process as possible to allow the player to make purchases if they want to while still being able to deliver as much content as possible to the player, and to give as many players the ability to play the game at whatever price point they feel is best for them as possible as well. We're already seeing a large number of games adopt the premium currency model. In some cases in their entirety, as is the case with big free-to-play MMOs from companies like Cryptic and Perfect World. And some companies are gradually integrating the concept of in-game currency that can be also circumvented with real money purchases like Blizzard's recent titles. And for the larger content packs and expansions, we're gradually seeing a shift toward the subscription-based model through the proliferation of the Season Pass, a model wherein content is rolled out gradually, but the player pays an upfront fee, aside from the cost of the standard game, for the whole thing. The entire economy of monetization is leaning further and further to a model where the fewest possible real money transactions are made. It wouldn't surprise me to see a large number of other games moving to a premium currency model to supplement their existing monetization as well. The largest hurdle to mount is the difficulty of premium currency purchase on the largest platforms. At present, outside of smartphones and Facebook, Payments require that the player invests in a single publisher's marketplace, which, though a benefit to the publisher, is like asking someone to sign up for a loyalty card at a store chain, enough of a hassle that a lot of people are going to turn their noses up against it. If a platform like Steam were to allow access to the Steam wallet as a means to make in-game purchases, I imagine we would see a much more widespread adoption of the model, including even the purchase of DLC in-game, but that's just my thoughts. What do you think about the future of monetization? Love it or hate it, everyone has an opinion on it, and I'd like to hear yours. Drop a comment down below and tell us where you think game business models are headed. Share your thoughts with the class. For now though, that's all I have to say. So thank you very much for watching, and I hope that you'll come back again very soon. If you haven't already and enjoyed this video enough to watch all the way to the end, consider subscribing. It'll make sure that you're seeing our videos when they come out, if that's something that interests you. Until next time though, thank you again and take care.